It's Luke chapter 15, from verse 1 through 7. From verse 1, it says, Now the tax collector and the sinners were all gathering around to hear him, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one Sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. And the title of today's message is uh, The Parable of the Lost Sheep. And if I were to give a subtitle uh, to today's message, it would be Go After the One. And that would be uh, the subtitle to today's message. Now, why is that? Of course, um, as you guys heard last week, uh, we introduced an evangelistic slogan for Gracia Church uh, for the year 2024. And so I hope to look then at this parable well today because actually when you think about it, uh, isn't that exactly what parables, the purpose, and what exactly parables are for? They are the eternal living water, meaning it is not just a story of a long time ago, but it should relate to us today. It should relate to us now. And so uh, it, it, in actuality, when you look at us you know, taking from um, this parable and having an evangelistic slogan to go after the one, you know, to evangelize you know, one person uh, even in this year, bring them to church, uh, even one person this year, to apply that in a real and a very living way to our life, that is what the purpose of parables is for, right? It's most biblically accurate to bring what Jesus gives as a parable, as a metaphor, as an analogy, right? And then start to apply it to my life and apply it to our church, Gracia Church, today. And for us this year, this is exactly uh, the reason why the Lord uh, gave us these parables, right? So uh, I do want to study what this parable means and, um, you know, how we can apply it. So first of all, the context. So uh, the Lord, he, he says here, it says here that he is speaking that all the tax collectors and quote unquote sinners were gathering around him. Right? So they were tax collectors, they were sinners. And then it also states that the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were like muttering something. Right? Essentially, they were slandering in the background. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Right? And so this was a slander. Right? This, is a, this is something that they want to say against Jesus, and they are muttering this in the background. So why is it that the Pharisees, uh, this, these people, were muttering behind Jesus and talking bad basically about him. Well, uh, for the Pharisees, they were a distinguished class of the Jews, right? So they were the people who kept the law. They were the ones who maintained their holiness, and they did it strictly. And so, you know, if there was a a way, like, you've got to do this. It's got to be this way, this way, this way, and you've got to keep yourself in a very strict way in this way or that way. That's essentially the atmosphere and the attitude of the law. It is to keep something like that very strictly. And so, you know, when you look at it, the tax collectors and sinners were the ones that didn't keep those things precisely at all, right? So who were the tax collectors? They were considered the betrayers to the Jews, right? And so, you know, for the Jews, they had this pride of their nation, right? We are the, 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 we are the, the nation of Israel. They had this pride to their nation like that. And then so the tax collectors, because at that time, Israel was just the colony of Rome, right? It was being subjugated to another country. And then so the tax collectors were viewed as betrayers to them, Right? So, you know, in a political sense, in a societal sense, you know, we see that tax collectors were really considered, you know, the bad guys, 
You know, these were the ones that were collecting taxes, collecting, getting money from Israel and then giving it to Rome, right? And so they were the betrayers to, betrayers to the nation. And then, you know, sinners, of course, were the ones that broke the law. They didn't regard the law, right? There's the holy law that should be kept in the Old Testament written, you know, in the Torah and Moses and the five books of Moses. But, you know, they, you know, they, they, were, the, they were the ones that were, were breaking the law all the time. And so, you know, for the Pharisees, they wanted to keep their distance from them, right? You know, we are not the betrayers. We, we love ordination, right? We keep the law, right? We keep the law. We're not like those other people. And so they wanted to keep their distance from them. So, uh, you know, looking at this kind of way, I mean, on one hand, you might think, well, you know, that's a good thing, right? I mean, you should you know, do that, right? I mean, uh, if I go and I tell my kids and, and, and they're in, like in school, right? <laughs> you know, to the kids, you know, when they're in school, I say to my kids, I say, don't hang out with those bad guys, right? Not the bad group of, of people, right? The one, those bad kids who are like smoking or something like that, like don't hang out with them. You know, these are the kinds of things that parents tell um, their children, right? And so, you know, when you think about it in that perspective, yeah, like keeping your your distance, right? I mean, it's a very smart and reasonable thing to do that we should, you know, draw the line and we have to protect ourselves and we should maintain our purity, right? And so, you know, that there's some some aspect like that when you when it comes to the Pharisees, they were doing something intelligent, something very reasonable at that, right? But you know, this intelligence that, this reasonable thing, this intelligence that the Pharisees had, right, these Jewish teachers, these Pharisees and all of them, it failed in one core aspect when it comes to their faith. And what was that? The core aspect is that this is not how God treats us. Right? It is not at all, actually, how God treats us. He does not distance himself from us. Right? This is shown very, very clearly in the Bible that this is not how the actions of God are. Towards the fallen man, right? God, he says, where are you? Right? He told Adam at the very beginning. And so he is the one that is reaching out, you know, with the whole heart to come closer to all of us, right? And so that is what the God of love is, right? So when it comes to love, right, this core, I mean, it may be something where we are keeping the purity, but, you know, when you look at love, there is this aspect where it, you know, it holds on to the sinner. It tries to go towards the sinner, right? So, you know, here's the thing about the God of love. This is something we can really say about, you know, this aspect with the sin. Like, how can we, you know, then, like, yeah, I mean, we, we can't necessarily say the it's a bad thing that the Pharisees want to keep away from sin. Like, we should be like that, too. We should keep away from sin. But, you know, there is an aspect where we should love the sinner, right? And so this is... You know, this is what we can say. This is the, the, the Christian ethic that we really come to understand from the God of love, that God, the God of love, he hates the sin, but he also loves the sinner. Right? He hates the sin, but he also loves the sinner. Right? And so it, it is because of that, because, you know, there is that distinguishing between what the sin is and then, you know, loving the sinner, the one who commits in the person who has fallen in that way that he loves us. You know, this is exactly why he came to us with love in his son, Jesus Christ, right? It is the Lord Jesus who bore our sin, right? Yet, at the same time, he embraced the sinner. So, you know, for the Pharisees, it was because of the sin, right? It was, this, is, this, is, this is good. It is, you know, we should avoid temptation. We should avoid the sin. But this is where they got confused. They, you know, took the sin and they took the sinner and they just put them together like this. And then, you know, avoiding the sinner, right? Avoiding the sinner. 
And then so what happened in that case was that it created a religious faith barrier, essentially, right? That, you know, we, you know, rather, I mean, we should, like, if, when it comes to the sin, we should divide the sin. Isn't that why Abraham, he cut the offering, right? I mean, in the Old Testament, that's why they take the sacrifice and they split the offering, because we should distinguish, right? It is very symbolic of that, that we should. We should have this distinguishing of myself and this holiness when it comes to the sin, right? But also in the Bible, it's not that, you know, we put this distinguishing when it comes to people, right? When it comes to the person, when it comes to the sinner. And then so this is why you see in, in Acts, the Holy Spirit, it, it brings all people together, whether you are a man or a woman or rich or poor or old or young or whatever you are, whatever ethnicity or whatever country you come from or background or the color of your skin or whatever it is, you know, the Holy Spirit, the Bible teaches us that we are all created in God's image and we are brought together by that, like that, in the love of Jesus Christ. And so, um, you know, the Pharisees, by, by mix, mixing, by putting these together, the sinner and the sin, right? And, you know, by avoiding them, what, what occurred was the creation of a religious faith barrier, right? Like a caste system, right? I mean, there's basically an upper class, you know, an upper religious class of people, the ones who keep themselves holy and pure, right? And then we put the other people on a lower class, right? The sinners, the tax collectors, these people, they are a lower class of people, right? And so, you know, of course, they were correct in hating the sin itself, but at the same time, their actions, right, betrayed what, what is knowing love, right? What is love inside of the heart? And so, you know, the heart, you know, really, really understands this, right? I mean, you know, for, for us, if we just like, you know, think about it, we would be exactly like the Pharisees. We would just think, you know, intelligently and, you know, avoid the, the sin and the sinner. And then it's, it's all this in the same way. But, you know, there's something in our heart that, that really, really understands this aspect well. That this is what love is, that we hate the sin, but loving the sinner. And so, you know, this aspect of love, we really find as we look in the Bible that we must, this is only really understood inside of the heart. And so, you know, we can also understand that this is also the reason why the Lord Jesus, he gives us parables. Right? This is the reason for parables. It is to explain this, right? Where intelligently, you know, we would just like, you know, just put them all, you know, over there. The sin and the sinner or, or, and all of that. Just put them all over there. We want complete avoidance like that. But, you know, it's only in love that we can really, really understand the embracing of the sinner. And so that's why Jesus, he gives us this parable, right? And so, you know, we should think, first of all, before we actually get into this parable, you know, why did Jesus choose, like, the way of the parable, right, in order to explain this love for us, right? And so, let's think about it. There's probably, I think, two ways to, in the Bible, like, you know, if we want to generally classify it, there are two ways in the Bible in which we can describe and explain love, right? And so, first of all, there's, there's the very clear way, like the very, very clear way. And so, this is the way that Paul writes inside of the Bible. This is also a very good and a very accurate way. So, let's look at that. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and in verse 4 through 6. So, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and in verse 4 through 6. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast. It is not proud, it is not rude. It, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Right. So just till verse seven, yeah, until there. So 
uh, it's very clear, right, in terms of the way Paul, I mean, if you go to a wedding, they love this verse, you know, to say this at weddings. It's like very clear, you know, we should take love, we should list it one by one, right, one by one, we should, we should list it. And so it makes sense, right? I mean, you know, they say, you know, when it comes to mankind, we are, uh, you know, philosophers, they'll, they'll say we are a logical existence, right? This is the term. You know, we are a logical existence, right? And so if we are a logical existence, or us as mankind, if we are a logical existence, you know, this is the reason why, you know, we, we study, we train our minds at school. You know, we want that logical existence of me to become stronger, right? And so, you know, there, there is that aspect, right? We should, like, if it comes to love, you know, the, that logical aspect of me should be trained and it should come out clearly. And so that's what Paul's doing, right? He teaches, right? He teaches in a very clear way, you know, what, it, what is love, right? But, you know, here's the thing, uh, besides what, you know, philosophers talk about or logical existence. What does the Bible speak about? The Bible speaks about our spiritual existence, right? And so, you know, we have a logical existence. We have our mind, of course, but, you know, even deeper than that, the heart, right? The spiritual existence that we have. You know, we, as we explore our faith, as we come to faith, as we, you know, grow older, grow deeper, you know, I think that this is definitely something that comes with age that, you know, as we, we, you know, we grow older is that, you know, the heart is, is much deeper. It's actually, you know, very mysterious, right? I mean, the, the heart is very mysterious in, in all its ways. And, you know, some of the things that you feel and that are in your heart, you can't explain with logic, right? I mean, you can try to, and Paul, Paul does, and he gives us, and he tells us the truth here. I mean, this is the truth of love, but... You know, even, you know, you can't classify everything with just words and logic, right? And then so, you know, take for example uh, that there's a child, right? And you ask that child, you know, you know, why, you know, why do you love me? You know, why do you love the parent? Why do you love your mom or dad, right? Like this. And so the child responding, you know, it's not like the child is going to be able to write some, you know, 10-page essay, you know, like you were assigned in school and like explain all this, like exactly like why, why is it that I love my mom or I love my dad, you know, like this, but you know, it's not like that. They just love, they, it's, they, you know, their heart, they, they are created, you know, children, they are created in God's image. So they have that same thing as us. They feel exactly the same way as us, right? As we get older, it's the same, same thing, but you know, they, they simply can't, you know, clarify it in like a 10-page essay or anything like that. But, you know, a child's heart of love is, you know, very, very precious, right? It is there, right? It is there. It is very true, right? And so, you know, we know. We know that it exists, and we know that it is very true like this. And so, you know, there's got to be other ways of explaining love besides, you know, the clear way. And so, uh, you know, there was a you know, these archaeologists, this was some time ago, these archaeologists, there was a site of a, a big, you know, volcano eruption, right? I, I mean, this, this happened, uh, you know, some hundred thousands, thousands of years ago or hundreds of years ago, whatever it was, right? And so this volcano erupted and then, you know, you know all of the, the lava comes out and then it like, uh, you know, fossilizes, like fossilizes everything, right? And then so, you know, hundreds of years later or whatever it is, the, um, you know, the, the archaeologists, they come in and they, you know, dig away, dig away, dig away. And then, they're, then, then, and then what do they see? You know, fossilized away, uh, you know, from this. And so what they see is that there is, a, you know, like the bones. You know, what I'm talking about is the bones. So it's very clear what, what's happening and, and what's happening between the bones. So there's, there's, there are two, right? So basically it's a mother who is uh, protecting a child. You know, I mean, that's, that's what, what's going on here. This, this mother, you know, the, I mean, the bones, they, the archaeologists, they saw it when they came here, the bones of the mother, you know, protecting the child like this. And then so, you know, the people saw that, and then they realized, oh, this, you know, this is love. You know, that is what love is. And so, you know, it's something like that, right? I mean, you know, we're not, 
you know, explaining it in such like very, very clear words, like clear terms like Paul uses in 1 Corinthians, there's that aspect where we do need to understand love in the way that Paul describes. But, you know, there, there is something else. There is the mother who is protecting the child, right? You know, this is love. And what is love as is shown in the Bible? Love is shown in the Bible as the Lord coming to us. Even when we were sinners, he unconditionally bore our sins on the cross for all of us. So, you know, unlike the Pharisees, you know, trying to understand everything of their faith intellectually, right? And then because of that, avoiding the sinner, you know, here the Lord, he uses a story. He uses a story, a parable, to explain loving the sinner, right? That, you know, it may not be in such clear words. It's not like a huge 10-page long essay that the Lord is giving us here, but it's very short. We just read seven verses in Luke 15, right? But this parable explains a very deep and mysterious world of how God can hate the sin, but still so unconditionally love and go towards the sinner, right? And that's what this parable is about. So the very first part of this parable, let's go back in Luke 15 and in verse 3 to 4. Luke 15 and in verse 3 to 4. Then Jesus told them this parable, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? So, when it comes to the sinner, right, we're talking about the sinner here today, right? So, who is the sinner? Right? That's me. Right? That's me. That's all of us. Each and every single one of us. Who is the sinner? It's me. I am the lost one. Right? That's what this parable, that's very clearly what this parable today is about. Right? It's to each and every single one of us. I, right? I am the lost one. I am the lost lamb. I am the lost sheep here. Right? And so, you know, this parable, what is explaining is God's illogical love for me. Right? And so he uses this parable to say, hey, there are 100 sheep right? And the shepherd, the shepherd, he keeps the flock. He keeps the flock. He has the staff, and he, you know, guides the sheep. He keeps the flock, and so the flock should be, you know, kept well, but the shepherd, he loses the one, right? He loses the one lost lamb, the one lost sheep, right? And so, you know, to go after the one lost sheep, he leaves the 99, and then he goes And he tries and he finds, he goes to find the one, right? He goes and finds the one. So, uh, logically speaking, if we were to take this from a logic perspective, you know, the 99, of course, are more important, right? You know, we would logically think so, that the 99 are more important. So, when I was young, uh, one of my favorite TV shows that I liked was Star Trek. Right? So you guys know this. Maybe you guys know where I'm going with it too. And so, you know, they have these Vulcans on Star Trek, right? They got the pointy ears. Maybe you know this, right? So they got the pointy ears. And these Vulcans, uh, they, they, have, they, they have no emotion, right? They're, they're these, this, this alien life form. They basically have no emotion, uh, only, only logic, right? So only logic in them, right? So, uh, of course, uh, the very famous... Uh, famous Vulcan, the most famous Vulcan of all in Star Trek is a guy named Spock, right? And so, you know, he goes like this. <laughs> so <laughs> you've probably seen that too. Uh, and so Spock, um, there is one of the movies that Spock is in, well, well all of them are in. Uh, but uh, what happens is, is that Spock, he sacrifices himself for everyone on the ship, right? So this happens. Like the ship is uh, about to blow up, right? And everyone's going to die, but he you know, stays in the control room or, or whatever it is, and then he, you know, he fixes whatever the problem is, um, but he dies while uh, everyone else on the ship uh, survives, right? So he sacrifices himself for everyone on the ship. And so, you know, there's this scene in the movie uh, where, you know, um, you know, already the, the door is sort of like 
like shut, right? I mean, he's already you know locked himself in in the in the room where where you know he's going to he's he's going to die and he's, he he has to be the the one remaining. But you know he can talk to his captain, right? And so um, you know what he says to the captain, you know, in his like you know one of his final words he's saying is he's saying. Uh, uh, this is a quote. <laughs> so this is a famous quote from Star Trek. It says, uh, this is what Spock says. So he says, logic clearly dictates the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. Right? So this is a very famous quote from Star Trek. And then he says, it's only logical, Captain Kirk. Right? He says it like that. So um, yeah, I mean, he's right, actually, when you think about it, right? I mean, yeah, we... You know, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. Right? It's very logical. It's a very logical thing to say, to sacrifice oneself for the many like that. And if you gave this exact same scenario to a large survey of people, they would probably say the same thing. Hey, we need to, you know, more than the one, we need to consider the 99. Right? We really need to take care of and we need to consider the many. Right? We need to consider not the few, but we need to consider the many. We need to consider the 99. But you know, today, you know, what the Lord is speaking about here today you know, is not a huge, like, large survey you know, sort of thing, like a large survey analyzing you know, what people would do right, in this circumstance and what they would say and what they would do inside of this circumstance, right? You know, that's not what the purpose, this is not why he is giving this parable, right? So it's not like this parable is going out to the masses of people out there, but this parable is going to me, right? This parable is going to me, the sinner, right? It's coming to me. It's coming to each and every single one of us. It's coming to the individual, right? And so, you know, more than a large survey being analyzed about, you know, what is the most logical thing to do, right? This speaks to the, mis the mystery of the heart. Like, what would we actually do, right? Not what we think we might do, but what would we actually do, right? Us who are more than our logical existence, but we have a spiritual existence. We have our heart. Right? We were created in God's image and we were created in love. You know, so, you know, what would we actually do? And so, you know, in practice, you know, we see this. You know, how is a, like a, a, a teacher, for example, and also a teacher has a large class, 30 students, right, let's say. You know, she's concerned, of course, with all of the students, but, you know, let's say that there is like one, one student Right? who is acting up, who is not really doing well. Maybe they look depressed or they have something going on or whatever, anxious and, and whatnot, right? And so, you know, for the teacher, even though she should like equally like give her heart and her attention to every single one of them, that is actually not what happens in practice, right? In practice, her heart is towards the one, right? That's what happens, right? This is how it is, right? And then, you know, let's say that we're busy with, like, so many things. Like, we have, like, a hundred things that, you know, we have to do. But, you know, let's say that we have a family member who's in surgery, right? Something like this. Then even those, we have, like, hundreds and hundreds of things to do. Like, I should really be studying for this midterm. I'm taking a test right now. But, you know, all I can think about is, you know, over there, right? What's happening over there? My family member who is in surgery right now. You know, that's all I can think about, right? And so, you know, the 99 versus the one that, you know, when it comes to love, love thinks very differently than or quantitative analytical ways in which the, the world measures. And in a practical sense, because we are, you know, beings of love, human beings that have heart, have love inside of us, Right? It, it doesn't always operate you know, so logical in that way that we know with our heart that you know, love, it simply works in a very different way. Right? It's, a, it's a, something just, it just, it just is. Like, this is. It just is. Like, we can't explain it. Right? We can't you know, say like one by one, list all the reasons why, but 
you know, we know. And, and, and that's what Jesus is describing here. He puts out this scenario, and it seems like, you know, something of long ago, like, you know, what would we know about shepherds and sheep? But, you know, we do, right? I mean, maybe I'm not in that same exact situation, but, you know, I can find, like, like I listed, you know, four or five situations already in today's message already. And, you know, you, we might, you know, yeah, maybe none of them are exactly what I'm facing, but, you know, each of us can can take this parable that the Lord is giving and apply it in a living way to us, right? That's why it's the eternal word, right? That's what makes it eternal, right? You know, so like, like word that is like limited, that is sinful, that just, you know, fades away. But the word of truth, the word of eternity, something like this parable, it keeps applying over and over and over again to us because, you know, we are, we are, we are beings of love. And so, you know, then understanding this parable and understanding that I am that lost lamb, I am the lost sheep, then you know, now we understand why God loves us so, right? Why is it that God loves us? It's, you know, should be actually, when you think about it for ourselves, myself, it's completely illogical. Like why, you know, why should God love someone like me, right? When I look at myself, I don't deserve love. I sin and I'm arrogant and I run away from God. And I have too many things that I have to do to make up for, right? I have so many things that I have to make up for. I have a lot that I have done bad and I need to make up for all of it. And it seems like, you know, I am not the one that, you know, God should love, right? This is how we all feel all the time. There is no reason for God to love me. Yet he still does. Right? Yet he still does. And this kind of love, it can only be explained with the shepherd who loves the one. Right? I am that one. I am the undeserving lost sheep that God loves. And so, you know, this is really what the Lord wishes us to know and remember, you know, no matter what circumstance, no matter what situation I'm in. You know, I may be in some circumstance where I think I can't get out of, right? Like, like I'm, you know, I mean, this parable really isn't just a parable of long ago. It applies to me in whatever situation, right? When I am lonely and I am depressed and I am anxious, and I feel so undeserving of God's love, then, you know, we should know that this, that that's actually when it more applies, right? It's not like it, it, it less applies, it, it's actually more so, right? More so when I'm more lost. That's the point of today's parable, right? It is the lost sheep, right? It's not just the sheep that is like, you know, a little bit, you know, a little bit far off in the distance, and I just need to call it over a little bit, right? Not like that. You know, the lost sheep. You know, the one that's completely gone. I, it's, it's not even in, in, in sight of the shepherd, right? Like, like that's, that's the feeling of when, 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 when you know, when, when it's lost, right? When you lose something, like, I don't know. I have no idea where it is, right? And so it's completely lost, and, and that is me, right? That's what a lost sheep is. Completely out of sight, completely cut off. That's what it seems like. But... You know, this love for, for me. You know, I still remember, you know, when I was uh, off in college and, you know, for the first time, right, for the first time off in college and then uh, parents dropped me off, right, and, you know, uh, it was like this feeling like I'm, I'm cut off, you know, from my parents, right? I mean, I was always together with them and then now, like, you know, they just you know, left me here, you know, in this college. I was excited on one hand, right? You know, I was very, very excited on one hand, but then, you know, it feels like, oh, I'm, I'm cut off, right? And then so, you know, this, you know, I, I still remember the feeling inside of me, you know, feeling lost, you know, like I was like so connected, but then feeling lost like this. And then, you know, it was also in college, like I, you know, when I give my testimony often, it is also that place where God found me. Right, where God found me. And I thought, you know, wow, you know, God, he loves me so much that amidst the, 
vast numbers of people that are on this campus, you know, he loved me and he chose me. And so, you know, love is like that. Love is irrational. It is paradoxical. But, you know, what we realize, you know, later, and what I realize later in terms of that love for me, and we all realize later, is that that love for the one is more powerful than anything, right? You know, it seems like that love should go towards the 99. And if there is love for, you know, that love for the 99, that that would be stronger, right? But, you know, the truth of what love is, that love is, you know, towards the one, and then that love, that love is more powerful than anything, right? So what happens? Let's look at the end of this parable. Uh, Luke chapter 15, and in verse 5 through 7. And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. And then he calls his friends and neighbors and together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. So, you know, more than the 99 righteous ones, the good ones who do not need to repent, there is more rejoicing, right? There is more power even, right? This is what is talking about the power of God's love. There is more power. There's more rejoicing. There's more, you know, the grace and the blessings pour down more over the one sinner who repents. That, you know, the shepherd is so, you know, he finds the one and it's like that, you know, this this kind of scene, you know, where the shepherd, you know, he finds the one lost sheep and so he, he puts it on his shoulders, you know, like that. That's how the shepherd would be, I think, you know, the shepherd, he puts it on his shoulders and then he, he goes home. Right? And then he tells everybody, you know, look, you know, look, I found, I found the one lost sheep. And so there is this, you know, overwhelming joy that the shepherd has. He goes and he tells everyone, you know, so powerful that 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 testimony of the shepherd who finds the one, it's something so powerful. It's more powerful than the 99 who are okay and righteous. You know, and so, you know, that's victory. That's victory, finding the one, right? Finding the one. And so, you know, it teaches us also this understanding for us as believers, as Christians, like what is true victory? You know, true victory is not, you know, gaining some success, right? Look, I, oh, I hit, I hit the jackpot. Right, I hit the jackpot. I'm successful or something like this in terms of the world. But no, there for for us as believers, what the Bible is teaching us as you know, true rejoicing, true grace and blessing is this joy, this overwhelming joy, right? This rejoicing. Like when we have that, that's successful. Right? That's what is successful. And that overwhelming joy comes from having concern for the lost one, right? the needs of the one, the needs of the few, the needs of the one, right? the lost one. Right? That's where victory comes from. And so, you know, we pray like this, right? In the Lord's Prayer, we pray, uh, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Right? And so, you know, what is that speaking about? And, and what do we always study when we speak about that? That is, of course, the Lord's prayer for uh, the universal salvation of God's kingdom, right? It is the Great Commission, right? But also, like, whose kingdom is this, right? This building of the kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven, whose kingdom is it? It's God's kingdom, right? It's God's kingdom, meaning his reign. Right? So it's all done in his reign. It's all done through Jesus Christ's victory. He died on the cross and he resurrected. And through that victory, you know, this is how the kingdom is done. It is done through God. Right? And so, you know, for us then, you know, what is our part in it? For us, we're simply called to be a part of that. Right? So it is God's reign, God's sovereignty, God's kingdom, and then we are called simply to be a part of that, right? So it's not I, it's not me as a human. It's not like I as a human am the one with the solution, 
right? It's not my kingdom, right? It's God's kingdom. So it's not human kingdom that's making the solution, right? And so, you know, how are humans then, you know, why am I talking about this? Like, how are humans when it comes to our solutions that we have inside of this world? Well, the history of the world shows it, right? The humans, we always, like, we come up with all kinds of solutions for this world, right? We make this solution, we make that solution for the world, but then what do we always do? We make it worse, I mean, that's how humans are inside of this world. We keep making it worse. We're greedy. We lust for power, right? We are depraved in sin. And so, you know, humans, when it comes to this kingdom and our solutions for the kingdom, if it was the human kingdom, we make it worse, right? So, you know, the reason why I'm talking about this is because, you know, individually, you know, when it comes to us is that we don't need to be so complicated, actually. You know, we're, sometimes we're like very, very complicated about, you know, about, you know, the solution for the world, but it actually doesn't need to be complicated. I mean, you know, like thinking of the kingdom in terms of like how I can come up with a, you know, with a global, a great global solution. You know, yeah, I mean, it's kind of good to think about that, but that's in, that's in God. That's a being a part of, of God and his kingdom. But remember, God, he looks at the heart, right? Meaning he loves the one. He loved me, the one, right? And remembering that that love for me is more powerful than anything else, right? That, mo- that love is that great rejoicing. It's, it's so much more powerful, the fact that God loved me, you know, this was more powerful than anything else, right? And then so, you know, that's the same thing when it comes to the kingdom as well, too, like being a part of God's kingdom. You know, more than thinking of like kingdom in terms of, you know, like the great global solution or something like this, you know, we need to think of the power of loving the one, right? That that's where the true power lies. It is in loving the one. Let's look at Luke chapter 17 and in verse 21. Luke 17 and in verse 21. Nor will people say, here it is or there it is, because the kingdom of God is within you. So it's in our midst. It's something we can experience all around us. In all aspects of my life, we can experience in, in, in every single little nuance of my life, I can experience God's kingdom simply be the one that loves the one, right? That loves the one lost sheep, right? In our lifetimes, God, he wants to call me. He wants to call me to learn this love. That's a, a life lesson. Like we are going to heaven one day, right? So we believe in Jesus, and then one day he's going to take us, and then we're going to, when we're going to heaven. But, you know, there's a reason why I'm still here right now on earth. There's a purpose. There is a reason for all of this. And so, you know, the reason why I'm here, it's, it, we can also look at it like school. You know, that's what life is. You know, life is like school. I'm preparing for a greater life in heaven. It's a much greater, much more beyond life in heaven. But this time period, this limited time period I'm having here on earth, it's like school, right? And so you guys, you know, some of you go to school. And so you go to school and you develop your mind and you're goal-oriented and you want to be successful. And then, you know, you want to, you know, gain measures of that success later on by, you know, having this, 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 you know, set up in your life. And so, you know, in school we do that to prepare her for all of that. And so, you know, maybe in school we'll learn all the reasons why the 99 are more important than the one, <laughs> you know, something like this. But, you know, when I look back at my school, you know, I, I, I barely remember anything. I think a lot of adults will tell you this, you know, people, you know, who look back on school. I didn't use anything <laughs> of any of those classes at all, actually, whatsoever. But then, you know, my time with other people. Right? My time with other people was much more valuable, that I was serving with brothers and sisters inside of church, you know, loving others and really developing myself in my heart. You know, these are the kinds of things that I remember. And so if you look at Romans chapter 8 and in verse 29, Romans 8 and in verse 29, and it says, for that, 
for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Right? So he chose us, he foreknew us, and then he wished us to conform to the likeness of his son. It means to be Christ-like. And so there is a glory that we will be, we will go to the same place as the Lord. We will be in heaven. But, you know, in the meantime, I'm being conformed, I'm being molded, I'm being educated, I'm being matured on a path in a Christ-like way, right? In a Christ-like way. And what does that mean? It means all of myself. It means all of my heart, all of my soul, all of my body, the little aspects of me, the every single day situations, my interactions with, you know, brothers and sisters here at church, with family, friends, and so on and so forth. All aspects of me are preparing me in a Christ-like way to be more like Jesus Christ before I go to heaven, right? Before I go to heaven. So, you know, all in my midst, like the kingdom of God in my midst, all of what is in my midst, my personhood, right? Even the weaker parts about me, the parts that are much more lacking in me that I think are very, very weak, actually, that part mostly, you know, Jesus Christ is working by the Holy Spirit to strengthen that place in a Christ-like way, right? And then so, you know, how? Like how in terms of the, the most way in which we can gain the power in order to, you know, be Christ-like and to develop and learn to be in a Christ-like way, you know, this parable teaches us, go after the one. Right? Go after the one. Like loving, like loving even the one soul. Like, when that happens, as I am even loving the one person, that's what God is doing. God is helping me develop and be closer to Jesus, right? You know, we could think about it like that. Even, like, the most weakest part about me, the most lacking part about me, maybe, I think, perhaps, it is for sure, actually, that God wishes to develop that by loving the one. Right? We should think about it that way, that the weak part about me, as I love the one, you know, this becomes the strength and the power in me. Right? To love the one, it's like a, it's a great life lesson for me, you know, <laughs> to be this joy in the kingdom of God. And so, you know, I want to end on Gracia's evangelism campaign for uh, 2024. It is to go after the one, right? <laughs> go after the one. And then so I wish that we can try with all of our hearts in this way, right? It can be uh, a family, a friend, a coworker, you know, that, you know, we bring to, to service, we bring to church, you know, or, you know, we have a group evangelism that we do on the campus and on the streets of San Francisco, you know, to bring in the one. But, you know, more than what I can do, you know, whether I, I do it this way or that way or, or whatever it is, you know, as I love the one lost soul, you know, God, he's actually doing more in me. You know, this is what happens. You know, God is doing more in me to be like Jesus. I really, truly wish we can be these ones. Right? Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, today uh, as we have uh, learned this very precious parable that the Lord has given us, Lord, uh, to Love the one lost lamb, Lord. We remember that we are the lost lamb, and this is your love for us, that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to all of us. And Lord, uh, we can know and we can see that testimony in our life about the great power of love and transformation in our lives, Lord. And Lord, you are continuing, that now that you've called us, you are continuing to call us uh, to be more like you, to be Christ-like in all ways and all aspects, Lord. And Lord, uh, you have also told us that in our life to uh, really learn the life lesson of love, to love even the one, to just love one, one lost soul, Lord. Uh, we wish we can be the ones to really, um, you know, uh, really receive your grace, your power in our life and to really love the one lost lamb just as the Lord loved us. We thank you. And in Jesus Christ's name I prayed. Amen.